Morning. That was for the folks out there. They're, they need to. <laughs> it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements uh, to let you know about as we're settling in here. Uh, first of all, we are going to be uh, starting Sunday school next Sunday, the 7th. Um, you nodded your head, Carrie, so okay. <laughs> All oh, right, yeah. Um, there is a couple changes to our schedule, though, on that I wanted to let you know about. Um, first of all, we are still looking at securing uh, leadership for our children's Sunday school. And so until that happens, the children's Sunday school, we're just going to have to wait until we were able to do that. Um, so just we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, for the adult, uh, junior youth is good to go. For the adult Sunday school, we're going to be offering two classes. Um, Dave Pavlek's going to be uh, offering a survey of the Old Testament, um, book by book as it goes through. So obviously when you, you know, get some of these massive books that you only have one Sunday to talk about, you'll basically be hitting the high points on that, but uh, there's some that are, uh, should be a good conversation. Um, and he's going to be out of town for a couple weeks and so we're going to be needing to start that one on the 21st. If you're interested in, in joining Dave for a discussion of the Old Testament, the 21st will be the first day that that begins. Next Sunday, on the 7th, I will be starting a, a survey of Romans. And so we're going to do Old Testament or Romans, whichever you uh, decide to, you'd like to participate in. So uh, that's going to start on the 7th. So just to run down, yeah, you got a question? Okay, you can join us, absolutely. You're very welcome. So, uh, so uh, next Sunday, Romans, uh, junior youth, uh, working on uh, securing the leadership for our, our children's Sunday school. And uh, then on the 21st, we'll begin that uh, survey of the Old Testament. So those are the, that's it. That's all I have. Do I have anything else, Sue? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes, that's a good question. Sunday school, we're going to start at... 9.45 to 10.45, so we'll take that hour, and I am not super disciplined about that, but I'm going to work on it. Dave will probably be better at it than me, but we're going to try to keep to that, that time frame so people can move in and out of that. Yes? Thank you. And that actually is a really good point on that. Yeah. Okay. So what we're looking at is having um, uh, kind of a concurrent... I don't want to take too much time up for worship here. Um, kind of a concurrent uh, uh, meeting with the parents and, and developing that, uh, uh, you know, getting a better sense of what they'd like to do for their kids and then working on bringing our, our young people uh, or leadership into that as well. So um, if we can't secure somebody for the children's Sunday school, they're welcome to join us in, in that adult study too. We'll, we'll try to give them something to do for that. They, they're welcome to share. I love having those young insights. So, okay, so... Sue, let's start the worship. Good morning again. Can't have too much good morning, right? I'd like to welcome each of you here. Um, it's always a good morning when we can be together and worship our Lord. And so wherever you are, those of you who are still joining, joining us by video, welcome to you as well. Psalm 26, um, verses 2 and 3 say, Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. So here's a scary thought. Uh, a, a speaker, Nay Bailey, uh, posed this question 
at once at a, a women of faith conference. Suppose that a video was made of your life, your entire life, everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever said or done, things you thought no one would ever know. And then it was shown on a big screen in the local theater for all your friends and family to see. For some of us, that might be a little frightening, even devastating. But then she said, God has seen your movie, and he still loves you. Even when he exposes the most frightening parts of your lives to the light, you are safe in that examination. He already knows everything there is to know about you, and he still cares passionately for you. Like a patient on the operating table, we are opened, examined, and changed by the great physician. When we open our lives, our hearts, to God, the master sur surgeon, who stands at the door knocking, waiting to come in, he will heal us. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, our great physician, our master surgeon, what a blessing it is to come before you, to be in your presence with your people, to worship you. Open our hearts, Lord. Examine us and heal us. Open our hearts and minds to your word and your message this morning, O oh Lord, that we may learn to love like you fully and unconditionally. Like the one you sent who loved us enough to die for us that we might have eternal life. In his holy name we pray. Amen. And now, another scripture from the Psalms. Psalm chapter 86, make sure I have the right one here, verses 1 through 7. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord. For I call to you all day long, bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. are flowing like a river. We'll do one, three, and five. <clears throat> Joys, Joys are flowing like a river since the comforter has come who abides for <clears throat> makes a trusting heart renowned Blessed quietness, lonely quietness, what a peace in my soul. Speaking peace to me, number three, like the main heaven, like the sun, like the sky, so the Holy Ghost. Yes. 
like to invite the kids to come forward. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, they're coming. Hi. <laughs> we made it good so I have a question that might be you might know you might not we'll find out okay do you guys know what a synagogue is have you ever heard of that word well it's in it's part yeah it's, it would be in a city in the bible the synagogue was a place where all the folks in Jesus' day would go to read the scriptures and talk about the scriptures and maybe they would, they would discuss things and they might do some prayer and some different things that would happen in this place called the synagogue. What does that remind you of? Church, exactly. It's sort of like, it's not the same as church, but it's sort of like church. It's the place where all the folks in Jesus' day would go to do those sorts of of spiritual scriptural things so you have to know about synagogues in order to understand the rest of this story okay so just keep that idea in your head so how many of you heard the story of the man that got lowered down through the roof for Jesus to heal him you remember this story yeah so it's a great story what happens it, they do get mad but this one, it, we don't know whether it was on the Sabbath day or not. So let me, let me tell you the, the part of the story that I want you to pay attention to, okay? So Jesus is in this place. He's in a house. And the people, they all gather around him, and they're really crowding close to Jesus. And Jesus is there. He's, he's proclaiming the word. He's teaching them about what God wants them to know. And all the people are very closely listening to him to the point where you can't even get into the house anymore. There are so many people in front of the house and outside the house and around the house that the door is blocked. And so you know this part, right? These guys are bringing this person who's paralyzed to Jesus so that Jesus can possibly heal him. And they get to the house and they're like, we can't even get in, right? So what do they do? You remember the story? They went to the roof. That's right. They went up on the roof and they said, okay, Jesus will come up here on the roof, right? No, Jesus is inside the house. And so what do they do? Yeah. They ripped, yeah, they ripped open the roof. They tore it and, they, and all this stuff and so they could lower the man down there into Jesus' presence and Jesus does heal him, right? So here's what I want you to think about today, Okay. These four friends that carried this man to Jesus, did they take this man to the synagogue? That's where we might think that Jesus would be, right? In a place where there's scripture reading, in a place where there's study of the word, when the, and there's prayer and things like that. Jesus seems like he'd be at the synagogue, right? That's right. He would go to where the people were. And if people want, if you want to get somebody to Jesus... You may not go to the place where you think that Jesus ought to be. You go right to Jesus. And that's what these guys did. They said, we, we probably could take him to the synagogue and maybe hope that Jesus shows up there, but it would probably be a better idea for us to take him right to where we know Jesus is. Right? And that's important for us to know, too. It's fine to invite people to come to church because we do talk about Jesus here and we do try to show Jesus here. But it's more important that we introduce people to Jesus than it is that we introduce them to church, right? Yes. So keep that in mind that you want to introduce people to Jesus. And I also want you to know this one. The best way to show people Jesus is in the way that we behave. If we're obedient to what Jesus calls us to, then, Jesus get, then people see a little bit of Jesus in us. Okay? All right, let's pray. 
Dear Lord, sometimes we get confused and we bring people to the wrong place. We take them to places where we think that Jesus might be instead of following, going right to where Jesus is. Jesus is always in the center of the, the need in our world. And so we pray that you would help us be clear in how we are bringing people to you. It may be at church, but it may be somewhere else too. But help us be faithful followers of you so that we can show people the way to you. And these kids, they are doing such a good job. And they're drawing close to you. And we pray that you would hold them close. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right, let's stand again, shall we? And let's sing, There is a Balm in Gilead. That's a balm, not a bomb. Guess what? We're in chapter two of Mark now. Yep, we're on the way. Yep. So, beginning in the first verse of that second chapter, we have this. You heard the story, and I'm sure you've perhaps heard it before, but let's read it together. When he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around, so, well, so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, and when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat, the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there. They questioned in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. 
And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Mark has a problem here. It's one that a lot of preachers have had. He's got a, such a good story, such a good introduction that uh, people that are reading this account might miss the bigger point that he's trying to make. I mean, this is one of the great stories of the New Testament. It's a wonderful account. These guys, they come to the house and they're carrying their friend and when they get there, the way is so clogged up that they come up with this idea to go up on the roof and uh, tear open the roof and let their friend down from the ceiling in front of Jesus. That's dramatic. I mean, think about that. That is an amazing account. The dark interior of the house, all shadowy, the people crowding close to Jesus, the scuffle and the scratching above, and then a shaft of light is the first crack opens up and then more light and the dust and the debris falling down into the room and then this guy on a mat being lowered down in front of them all right into the midst of them that's dramatic right who's not going to get caught up in a story like that mark's problem is that the story of this paralyzed man as important as it is as rich as it is it actually isn't the central point of what he's trying to say He's got other important things that he wants to get across, and, and we get caught up focusing on the miracle here. How many times have we heard the story told this way? The paralytic friends bring him to Jesus. They find the ways blocked, but their, their faith compels them to find another way, and they open up the roof, and they lower the man in front of Jesus, and Jesus, who is moved by their faith and their audacity, heals the man. At the word of Jesus, he takes his mat and he goes home. How many of you have heard it that way? Did you miss something there in the text? There's more there than just that. Considering their example of faith, that's a, that's a good lesson for us to learn. It's faith that won't be deterred. That, that's important. But, but how often have we missed what's going on in the shadows of the room? In the faces and in the hearts of those that that stood there. Is there more to this story than what's, that, than what's happening outside of the light there that's shining down from that hole in the ceiling? Well, we're going to take a look at the characters in this story a little bit. And since we're always supposed to gather something from the Word, gather something from the story that, that benefits us as the later followers of Jesus, I want to encourage you to put yourself into these characters' place. Uh, Think about their actions. Think about their responses as if they might be your own. If you were there that day, if you were there that day, what would you do? How would you act? What would you think? What would be in your heart? Now, I usually don't follow the old preacher's pattern, uh, what they used to refer to as sermons consisting of three points in a poem. But today I'm going to try that. There may not be a poem at the end, but there will be three points, three sections, three character studies. It seemed like a good way to get through the complexity of this, this story without losing sight of all the things that Mark wants us to know. And I'm even going to try to use a little alliteration like they used to do. Each of the characters in our message begins with the letter F. There's the faithful, there's the friend, and then there's the fussers. You write that down, right? First, the faithful. These are the four guys that come uh, bringing this paralyzed man to Jesus. Remember the context of the account that we read today, what Mark has already told us about the situation. Back in the first chapter, again, Jesus earlier, he came into Capernaum for the first time and he makes it his home base where he's kind of basing his ministry. He's done a lot of powerful things there. There's the exorcism in the synagogue. There's the healing of Simon's mother-in-law. There's the, all of the crowds that came and gathered around Simon's house in that evening of the Sabbath, hoping to be healed, hoping to be delivered, hoping to be restored. Jesus has established his authority in no uncertain terms, in powerful and profound ways. First, there's the authoritative interpretation of Scripture. He taught not like the scribes, but as one with authority, something they couldn't claim. 
And then Jesus displays his power over evil by, by casting out this, this demon, simply telling him to get out, and he goes. There's no hocus pocus, no incantations. It just happens. No sickness was too much for Jesus. A simple touch, fever and leprosy are, are driven away. It's probably the healings that made Jesus so popular in Capernaum. People did want to hear what he had to say about the kingdom of God and the way that it was breaking into the world. That was good news, to be sure. But there was a lot of them that had more immediate concerns. Their sickness, their infirmity uh, of their bodies was such that they couldn't really concentrate on all that theological stuff. So they came to Jesus in droves, in crowds, and Jesus, who was ever compassionate, heals them. But unfortunately, it was starting to get hard for Jesus to do what he came to do, to, to fulfill his central purpose, proclaiming the good news. So many people were coming to him that he had no space to even think. He had to go out early in the morning to pray when it could be quiet. And then he had to stay out on the periphery. We see it at the end of chapter 1. He couldn't even go into the towns that he was trying to visit. They all came out to meet him in the wilderness. And it's likely that a good number of them came out to be healed. His reputation as a healer was spreading like wildfire. Obviously would. So, this is the understanding. This is the, the mindset in the crowd that had gathered around Jesus when he came back into Capernaum a few days later. Verse 2 says that he was speaking the word. So, this gathering wasn't expressly a time of physical healing. It was a preaching time, a proclaiming time. But I think it would be naive for us to think that there weren't people in that crowd. A great number of people there were expecting, even hoping, uh, to witness a miracle. Something powerful and wondrous, as well as a number that were there specifically hoping that that miracle might be for them. People were starting to believe. People were starting to hope. Faith, even in its very nebulous form, is starting to grow. Not quite there yet, not rightly directed yet, but people were starting to see. They were starting to recognize Jesus as the one that Mark has been telling us. One that Mark has been showing us. The powerful, the authoritative, the Son of God. Now, we don't know much about these. Wouldn't you like to know a little more about these guys? These four faithful friends. They, they probably recognized that their paralyzed friend had little chance of encountering Jesus unless somebody took the effort to get him into Jesus' presence. Couldn't go anywhere on his own. For whatever reasons that they had, they, they had come to believe that Jesus had the power to cure their friend. Maybe they had witnessed this power firsthand, and, and they're not going to let anything, not going to let anything stop them from getting their friend close to Jesus. Now, seeing things as we do from this side of the cross and understanding we're trying to perhaps a little more, we know that the healing that Jesus offers is much deeper and more profound than simply restoring someone's health. But there is a wonderful reflection in the actions of these friends, the saving faith, and the way that these four faithful don't let anything stand in their way, nothing between them and their heart's desire, that their wounded, that their broken, that their paralyzed friend would meet Jesus. There's a good lesson there. Do we have the same passion? Do we have the same heart for bringing our spiritually paralyzed friends into the presence of Jesus? Or are we like the crowds who gather around Jesus and end up just barring the way? Next, we need to examine that friend. Now, Mark doesn't tell us much about him. There's not really much there. He's probably the most passive person in the whole story. Uh, he may have indicated at some point in the past to his four friends that he wanted to be healed, but it really appears that he's just along for the ride, literally and figuratively. It's his faithful friends who bring him to the house. It seems like they're the ones who come up with this, this idea to go up on the roof and tear open a hole. And later, the friend, after being healed by Jesus, simply does what Jesus tells him to do. Take up his mat. Walk out the door. It Prior to this healing, he seems to be displaying not only a paralysis of the body, but a paralysis of the will as well. Now, there's so little to go on here, and since that's the case, examining the character of the friend is going to be an exercise in speculation. But there are some things I think we can see in this exchange between him and Jesus. In the story, 
Mark explicitly tells us that Jesus knows the hearts of people that he encounters. And so I suspect that as this man is being lowered down and through this gaping hole in the ceiling, I think Jesus knows exactly what he needs. There's no mistaking that. It's just not that obvious. Keep in mind that this man, as he comes to Jesus, or what perhaps his faithful friends were hoping for, what they're, what they're anticipating is a physical healing. Okay? There's nothing, nothing in any previous account in Mark, and again, we've only gone through one chapter here, but we haven't seen it. There's nothing in the Old Testament. There's nothing in the, any of the teachings of the experts of the law up until that time that would give any kind of precedence for what Jesus does next. It is un precedented now they've witnessed Jesus's power over infirmity perhaps many of them have seen Jesus heal people and that's what they're hoping for that's what they're expecting in this case they want Jesus to heal their friend the friend himself the man wants to be healed that undoubtedly is why he's there even though there's a prevalent understanding at the time that there must be some connection between sin and suffering, these four faithful and the friend, they're not there to address the sin that might be lurking beneath the surface. That just is not the place you would go to deal with this. To be free of infirmity, well, that's Jesus, that's what he's been doing. That may be something that he can help with. To be free of sin, well, that's something God does. That's God's work. And so what Jesus does here, what Jesus says here, is really beyond radical. In the eyes of some, it's, it's downright blasphemous. Now Jesus can see the man, can see his condition, knows that the expectation is that Jesus would heal his body, but instead, what does he say? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now again, Mark doesn't offer us any details whatsoever about what those sins might be. And Mark doesn't make any connection between the sin and the paralysis. But what Jesus is doing is looking beyond the obvious, beyond the obvious infirmity of this man's body and seeing the infirmity of his soul. And this is what Jesus does with all of us. You see, there are no secrets with Jesus. Jesus sees all the brokenness all the sickness, all the pain, all the suffering. Jesus sees not only the blemishes on the outside, but the stain of pride and selfishness, the bitterness, the corrupted longing, the putrefying covetousness and idolatrous devotion that paralyzes the spirit. And Jesus wants to heal. Not just the physical, but the whole of us. Again, this friend is a little bit of a cipher we don't know that much about him we don't know what's going on on the inside nothing that mark says gives us an indication but there must have been something happening maybe something that jesus alone saw i wonder about this brief moment of time this brief moment of time between when jesus says your sins are forgiven and when he says take up your mat and go home think about that for a second He's laying there, still paralyzed, we can assume, thinking, that's not really why I'm here. I don't really know what to do next. Uh, there's no indication that Jesus is going to go further than forgiving his sin. But maybe that was enough. Maybe that was the healing that he truly needed. There's all sorts of examples of faithful people, forgiven people still suffering in their bodies, Paul had his thorn, and, and we may have infirmities of many sorts. In fact, the infirmity of the body is often a path towards greater faithfulness as we depend upon God's grace instead of our own strength. Again, there's a lot that's left unsaid here, so it is pure speculation to try to get into that friend's head in any way, but his actions do show us something, something we can take. For those that have been forgiven, for those that have been healed, obedience becomes the only option available to us. After all, look what Jesus did. When Jesus restores our soul, even if the body still suffers, we can still obey. There is much that we are called to do that we can do, and Jesus is not going to ask us to do anything that he does not equip us to do. If he wants us to take up our mat and walk, then he will strengthen our limbs to do it. 
And so if Jesus says that, then get up and take up your mat and walk. Finally, we come to what I suspect is Mark's point, and it's centered on this final group of characters in the story, the, the fussers. You know who we're talking about. When the four men who carried that paralytic stood in the light of faith, and the friend that they lowered into Jesus' presence was illuminated, and then once healed in body and in soul, walked out into the light of obedience, these guys, the fussers, they're still in the shadows. They're still in the dark, in that murkiness. And there's no indication that they want anything different. Here's why we know that this is the important part of what Mark is trying to get across. There's a literary device that they use here. It's called an incalcation, where you take a piece of bread and a piece of bread and you put the meat in the middle. It's a sandwich. And the miracle story is the first part, and then the meat is what we're talking about now, and then you get the conclusion of the miracle as the bottom part of the sandwich. You're looking quizzical there. You following? Okay. So this is the sandwich, and the meat is what we're looking at now. All right. The important part of this is this. The miracle story is a compelling one. I'm not going to deny that. It's, it's so important, but it's, it's so compelling that we might miss this meaty part of the middle. This is a story of something bigger than just a healing. If you look forward in the text, and we're going to be looking at these verses as we go along, there are five stories that are coming up. This is the first of the five, all right? There are five stories that are coming up, beginning in the first verse of chapter 2, going to the sixth verse of chapter 3. Five stories that indicate the rising resistance to Jesus coming from the religious establishment. There's a discussion about who you get to hang out with, who's appropriate to be friends with. There's a question about the Sabbath and whether it's right to do this or that on the Sabbath, to eat to eat on the Sabbath, to harvest grain. There's a, there's a question, the final one is another healing in the synagogue and whether it is appropriate to heal on a synagogue. Five stories that illustrate this rising resistance to Jesus. Now, I don't want you to make too much of the fact that these, are, that these people, these fussers, represent the religious establishment. That's, that's what they do. It's significant. We will explore it. But understand that what we're really talking about here is people in power, people that have control. In the context power is held uh, through the exercise of religious control because they're religious people. And so this is going to be a big part of their life. It makes sense that they would be involved in religious things. But again, it's not really so much about religion as it is about power and control. So these five stories that are coming up, this is the first of the five. Mark is going to contrast the authority of Jesus, the rightful authority of Jesus, the true authority, with the supposed authority of the religious elite. And there's an escalation. You'll see it as we go along here. In this story, they're fussing in their hearts. They're keeping it to themselves. In the final story, at the end of that sixth verse in, uh, in chapter 3, they're openly conspiring with the Herodians to kill Jesus. You see that escalation? It just gets worse for the, as it goes along. Their issue is this initial response that Jesus has when the man lower, is lowered down in front of him. Their issue is, is what Jesus says in response to the actions of the faithful and the friend. As we mentioned before, Jesus knows the heart and, and can see that this paralytic needs a lot more than just a physical healing. He understands that. And also, we know that this faithful four, the, and probably even the friend, the paralytic as well, they were not hoping for more than just that, a physical healing. Now, a lot of commentators, they dig into the concept that this connection between sin and suffering and, and the way that this man might have had a sin that was so profound that it caused a psychosomatic paralysis. He, his guilt was so great that it froze his limbs. I don't know. Could be. But I don't think that's what Mark's getting at here. I don't think that's the point. I think that this is an example of the way that sin and suffering, while potentially connected and related, they're not necessarily of one piece. It's not really about the relationship between sin and suffering here. It's about the authority of Jesus and what Jesus can do in a situation like this. And the scribes saw that immediately, and maybe we should as well. So what's the beef that the fussers have here? What's the problem that they have? 
It's that Jesus is claiming to do something, to be able to do something that only God does. Right? This is how we know that the faithful and the friend were thinking of only at this point of healing for the body, not forgiveness of sin. There's nothing in the history, nothing in the teaching, no concept of any human person being able to do this, to do what only God can do, to forgive sin. In the Old Testament, not even the Messiah, according to their understanding of the Messiah, would do this. Since sin is ultimately an offense against God, God is the ultimate aggrieved party. Only God can offer any kind of true forgiveness. That's the way they're thinking. Now a priest, and here where we may have a little bit of a hint of the the heart of the offense here that Jesus is giving here. He's infringing on their turf is what's happening. But a priest could tell someone that their sins were forgiven, that God had forgiven them, but they don't themselves offer that forgiveness. That's not the way it works. And so whatever it is that Jesus is doing here in this story, by saying, son, your sins are forgiven, it's clear that the scribes see it as usurping the authority that rightly belongs to God. It's claiming a right in power that Jesus, according to them, should not be claiming. Now, on one level, and this practical level may have been the actual real source of the contention, Jesus is essentially rendering all the old ways obsolete. If everything that Jesus does in this story is legitimate, and I think you you would attest to that it is legitimate because Jesus is doing it, if everything that he's doing is legitimate, then there's no need anymore to participate in those annual temple rituals. Those, 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 those acts of atonement that they did once a year, one could simply go to Jesus. This delegitimizes the whole religious structure and it robs those religious elite of their power and their control. And yeah, that's going to create problems. Isn't it? It's going to create problems. But think about it from their perspective for a moment. They're, that their heart's concern is a valid concern. They need to have this addressed. We have to take a look at it. You see, if what Jesus was doing was not legitimate, then that charge of blasphemy is appropriate. Jesus is really going out on a limb here. It's like the fussers are saying, you know, healing people of their physical infirmity is fine. We're, we're okay with that. Go ahead and do that, Jesus. The teaching with authority stuff, we can accept that as well. Now, you're stepping on some toes in the process, but, but you know, we've got this tradition of arguing about the law, so it's okay. You'll, I think you'll, you'll get along fine here. But what you're doing, Jesus, here, it's too much. You're going too far. Before, we thought we'd be able to fit you into and make you part of the establishment, Maybe a fringe player for sure, but definitely we can, we can work you into the, the system. But if you're going to claim something that only God can do to be able to forgive sin, then we're going to have a problem. You see, at this point, they're left with only two options about relating to Jesus. Only two options are available to them. Either Jesus is a blasphemous troublemaker or Jesus is exactly who Mark has been telling us that he is. That's it. That's the only two choices that you got in front of you at this point. And now here's the logic of the scribes. A healer, somebody who could heal people, they had to be granted that ability uh, by God. That authority to heal had to come from God. God does not give that authority to blasphemers. That's just not the way God works in their understanding. And so if, if Jesus is a blasphemer, then he can't heal. That's just simple logic, right? If Jesus is a blasphemer, then he can't heal. And so in this limited sense that the scribes have, the scribes understood that prior to this point that Jesus had been acting on God's behalf, acting with God's authority. But Jesus goes beyond that here. Jesus goes beyond just acting as God's agent. He does something that they understood that only God could do. And then he authenticates that by subsequently healing this paralytic. So the first option, 
that he's a blasphemous troublemaker, that gets ruled out. That can't be the option anymore. Because he tells this man, he says, take, get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man does it. Because that happens, Jesus can't be the blasphemous troublemaker that they thought he was. He has to be something else. He has to be someone else. It's no wonder they're fussing here. This is a radical confrontation of their whole worldview. The only option that's left with, to them is the one that they can't accept. That Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. I know that I get tempted to focus on the miracle part of this story. I mean, it is a compelling story. I love the, the faith that leads up to this miracle. And I don't want to minimize those elements. They are certainly important. They teach us something about faith that doesn't quit. They teach us about compassion uh, for the needy. They teach us about our obedient response to the gift of healing and forgiveness and the, and the touch of Jesus. And there's no denying that this is a compelling story. It's got all the cool elements into it. The, the, that conflict of, the, of them encountering this crowded space where they couldn't even get through. The crisis where they, they go up on the roof and they say, should we do it? Should we tear open the roof? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's tear the roof open and, and let them down. And then that final wonderful, glorious resolution, uh, the commission that the man receives from Jesus, take up your mat and walk. That's great stuff. So dramatic. But Mark is using this very compelling and dramatic story to also introduce us to a greater conflict, the one that follows the whole arc of the, 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 the gospel message, the conflict between Jesus, the one with rightful authority, and a powerful establishment that doesn't deserve to have the power that it has. Now here it's religious in nature, but Jesus is going to challenge the political establishment of Rome as well. It's coming up. Mark wants us to understand that, that Jesus shook those pillars of power and caused them to crumble because Jesus has the authority to do that. Jesus is not some provincial miracle worker that, uh, that, that, that does some nice things and teaches some stuff that, that's kind of, kind of interesting and maybe a little different. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. The redeemer of all things. The one who restores both body and soul. And Jesus is still doing this. Still challenging these power structures. The systemic ones in our world that contribute to all the oppression and the destruction. And the ones within our own hearts. As we refuse to allow Jesus to reign with his rightful authority. Now we want to be the faithful, right? Bringing those needy to Jesus. And at times we recognize that we're the friend, ourselves in need of Jesus' healing and forgiveness. But I think if we're honest, I think we might find ourselves most often in the fussers. Those frustrated, even scandalized by the inbreaking kingdom of God. We don't like the way that Jesus challenges our carefully constructed edifices, the way we've arranged our world so that we can have power and control over the situations. We don't like the way that his light shines into the darkened interior of our hearts. It's difficult for a fusser to accept the rule and the reign of Jesus. And that's the fusser's sickness. But Jesus comes to heal all. Faithful, friends, and fussers alike. And if Jesus is who we see him to be, not just an authoritative teacher, not just a worker of miracles, but the very forgiving Son of God, then what does that mean for us? Let's pray. Gracious God, it is true that when we sin, we sin against you. It is true that you are the aggrieved party by our willfulness. And we recognize that true forgiveness can only come from you. 
But Lord, we are so deeply blessed to see the way that you do forgive. You offer it freely, without reservation. A simple act of repentance on our part is all it takes to open the floodgates of forgiveness. And Lord, we see in this story the way that that forgiveness worked out in the lives of this paralytic man, the way that it reflected the faithfulness of his friends, and the way that it inevitably challenged these fussers, the people that didn't believe that your son was who he said he was, didn't believe that he had that right. But Lord, we have experienced better than that in the way that you have forgiven us, in the way that we have found eternal life through Christ's blood. Help us to be fully devoted to Jesus, to follow him faithfully in all things, to be obedient to that commission that he has laid upon us, and to not fuss when things don't go our way, but to simply be devoted. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Stand and sing, take my life and let it be one, five, and six. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in Jesus' praise. Let them flow in Jesus' praise. Take my will. final verses of this song to you again hear these words that we just sang take my will and make it thine it shall be no longer mine take my heart it is thine own it shall be thy royal throne it shall be thy royal throne take my love my lord i pour at thy feet its treasure store take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Bow with me. Gracious God, we would be yours. We give you all of our lives, everything that is in our grasp, everything that we find in our control, we give to you. Our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind, it is all yours. Take it and use it to the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless this body and their commitment to you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may go in peace.